The story you're about to hear could be a hoax or it could be one of the great exposés of espionage in history. I know that sounds overdramatic, but after you hear what you're going to hear, perhaps you can be the judge. With me is a gentleman we will call Richard Sanders. And I'll very quickly, Richard, tell your story because I think I've heard it enough. I can tell it more succinctly so we can get to the heart of it. But the essence of this man's story is that after being a British agent during World War II, he went to Australia and settled and was in the Secret Service there. And in 1958, came back and at the Brussels World's Fair of 58, discovered there was a Nazi movement alive and very active in West Germany. Right. When he told his former British Secret Service colleagues about it, they asked him to go back to West Germany undercover to reassume an identity he had established right after the war as a Nazi to find out what was going on. And thus began in 1958, 16 years of living undercover posing as a former Nazi, a former SS officer, officer. in West Germany. Right. Suddenly you were found out in 1971. Yes. Uh, you had to flee West Germany for your life. You spent a few months in Britain being debriefed. Several attempts were made on your life and you were re-established and re-emigrated into America in January of 1971 where you've been living. 75. I'm, I'm sorry, 75. Yeah since January 75 in a remote area in South Florida, your homestead. Right. You called me one day because you'd watched my television program shortly after the hijacking and the suicides I put in quotes in the jails in Germany. Right. said, you must tell the world what you know. And thus began for us here at WTVJ in Miami an incredible series of events culminating with Richard's arrest by the FBI charging that he was a international con man forging U.S. passports, claiming he has a record from Australia, from, from England, uh, of uh, all kinds of nefarious crimes, to which you reply is the British Secret Service attempt to discredit you, destroy your story, so we'll forget about you and your story. Right. Is that a fair representation of where we bring us? That is a fair representation of what I've told you. Basically, what is your story? Tell us, Richard. As you said, I went back to Germany in 1958 to act as a undercover agent for the British Secret Service. I had done that before from 1945 to 1948 to uncover any action of a German underground movement which the Secret Service expected. Would there was a, uh, the, the Nazi yeah. mentality and the organization staying alive. Yes. The, um, the British never really expected the Germans, the Nazis, just to give up. They were, have always been worried that they would make a comeback. And for three years I was undercover as a SS officer. Assuming was, a, a, for a dead SS officer's identity. That's right. By the name of? Franz Rath. And I was on the run. Okay. Yeah. Even in those days, um, the Germans helped me, you know, when they heard I was on the run, I was an SS officer on the run. I never had any problem finding people to hide me, finding people to to give me a place to stay. This was right after World War II? Right after World War II. In, in Germany? In Germany. There was never any uprisings against the British occupation, and it was my own belief that the, the service was wrong. I thought the Germans were finished, they had given up and that they were out, and I said as much in my report. However, in 1958, at the Brussels Fair, I met one of the Germans who had befriended me um, during my three years undercover in, in Germany. And he invited me to come back with him to Germany. And I was surprised to see that the man had grown tremendously wealthy in a matter of 10 years. Um, he told me that he had been helped by a secret organization that helped ex-German uh, service people, uh, officers, to find jobs or to uh, establish their own businesses. I went back to Britain and spoke to um, the former chief of the secret service, General Menzies, 
told him this story, which more or less confirmed his suspicions. He talked to the then head of the Secret Service and also to the Foreign Secretary. I know this is against you. What was the man's name at that time, head of the Secret Service? His name was um, Richard Goldsmith White. Okay. Um, Lord Hume, who was then the Foreign Secretary, uh, gave permission for an undercover agent to be sent to Germany to find out more about it. And I accepted the uh, assignment and I went. Now you had a family in Australia, children. Okay. You left them behind and then yes. assumed this, reassumed this identity. Yes, in 1958. Why did you do that? I mean, well, I wouldn't do it if you asked me today. But I Why'd guess. Why did you do it then? I was anxious to to uncover this organization, and I was told. I was the only one in the service who could do it. You speak German, I Dutch. speak German, Dutch, French fluently. Right. How long were you told it would, it would last? Then? Well, it was a matter of, you know, a few months in the beginning, then maybe a year, maybe two years. But as you know, it has lasted 16 years. Right. So 1958, you returned to West Germany, make right. re-established re contact with this general, what was his name? Um, Daling, Daling, Jakob Daling, who was living where, doing what? He was uh, living in München Gladbach, and he had this very large factory making metal windows and doors. So very successful. So you went back, and what did you tell him? I mean, here you came out of nowhere. Where'd you tell him you'd been since the end of the well, war? Well, I had been tanned to a very deep tan by the Australian sun, and I invented a story that I had been in Spain, um, hiding in hiding, like many other Nazi. SS officers were, which explained my, my tan, mm -hmm. and um, he accepted that story. He then told me I could safely stay in Germany because the Nazis had so much influence that there was no fear of any prosecution. I mean, I was under that name, I was still a wanted man, you know, right. a, a, a right. Bergen Belsen concentration camp officer. In other words, the, the real Franz Roth had been a guard at Bergen Belsen. Well, more than a guard, he was an officer. Okay. Right. He, he was responsible for a lot of the atrocities that okay. happened in the camp. So here you are, 1958 now, you've returned to West Germany, you have assumed the identity of this Franz Roth, and what happens? I worked for about a year in the uh, factory in München Gladbach. What kind of a factory? Um, metal windows and doors. Okay. I very guardedly let it be known that at heart I was still a Nazi and that um, you know I would like to see the days of Hitler return. Finally after a year um, a man came to see me. This man uh, introduced himself as uh, Gert Hangerer, a former SS colonel. Um, he interrogated me at great lengths about my past um, and my present-day sympathies. Apparently I gave him the right answers because he came back after a few weeks and told me that uh, his organization was prepared to help me set, set up my own business. What organization? Did it have a name? Yes, they called it the uh, Outer Circle. In German that would be? Außenring. Okay. I accepted his offer and I was given management training in industry. I received uh, um, bank credits, quite considerable sums of money. I was given key personnel, like foremen, um, office workers, draftsmen, and set up a factory in, Munch in uh, Düsseldorf, which is close to Mönchengladbach, where I was working. The uh, factory flourished. I made a lot of money. Of course, the loans all had to be repaid with interest. My only <clears throat> way of getting more information was not from my former friend Daling, because he didn't know much. But I realized I had to get information from Hangar. He seemed to be the man close to the uh, source, the top of the organization.
Now let's let's be sure we understand. All this time you were were you in contact with your superiors in England, the British Secret Service? Yes. <clears throat> I had a, arranged a weekly telephone call. But this was just to let him know that I was still all right. This call was made to the British consulate in this, uh, the same town where I was living. Right. Um, all my reports were handwritten reports which were just dropped into the mail and mailed to London. Okay. This man, Hangera, um, after I befriended him, gave me, in the course of years, uh, a lot of information. He had been Heinrich Müller, the head of the Gestapo's adjutant. And from him I learned that, together with Müller, he had escaped to Switzerland after the war, when the war was finished. One, two, three, we're back. Now let's okay. let's go back now. Who was Gert Hengerer? Gert Hengerer <coughs> was the man who came to see me and interrogated me um, to find out my background as an SS officer and my sympathies and to help me set up my own factory. Now, Richard, let me interject a question. I thought all SS officers had tattoos with numbers on their bodies. That's true. You didn't? No. Didn't he ask to see your tattoo? No, because after the war, or close towards the end of the war, most SS officers removed their tattoos. Wouldn't there be a scar? Couldn't you see? In something? some cases there were scars, depending on how it was done. But if it was done by a doctor, there were no scars. I have seen plenty of SS officers where it was done and okay. left no scars. All right, so he came to see you. What happened? Well, he helped me to set up my own factory. and. I realized that he was the man who had information, and he was the man I should therefore befriend. And um, I played up to him. Um, he loved girls and he loved drinking. Um, so I had drinking parties with him. I arranged girls for him. And slowly he relaxed towards me. And uh, after heavy drinking bouts, we used, we used to talk about the good old times. and. Over the years, I got a lot of information from him. Did you actually know enough about the, quote, good old days to be able to carry on a conversation with another man who had literally lived those times? Oh, yes, of course. How did you learn all that? Well, I was a undercover agent during the war in occupied Holland, Belgium, and France. I lived amongst the Nazis. I had joined a Nazi organization uh, in order to get information. Anyway, before I was sent out, I had been fully trained in Britain uh, for months and months in Nazi organization, in Nazi ways. Uh, I had been trained by people who had lived in Germany. Okay, so we, we've seen movies about that. We understand the process, that you're, you're indoctrinated to, to think you are Franz Rath. That's right. But how does that account for the fact that at any moment you could have met somebody who knew Franz Rath and could have said, you're not Franz Rath? Well, what happened was the, the real Franz Rath was incarcerated um, after the war in Recklinghausen camp. This was a British camp in which the, the whole staff of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp was confined and tried and eventually hung, most of them were hung. Um, and Franz Rath was there. Um, he escaped or tried to escape and he was shot by a British, a British sentry. After he was shot, the British tried to inform his next of kin. And they then found that he had no next of kin. I mean, he had lived in a town called Dortmund, and that town had been uh, bombed heavily by the Allies. And um, his, his whole family had been killed. And of course, when something like that happens, the British Secret Service picks up that information and then decides, well, we can use this man, this man's identity, for one of our own agents. Right. There was very little chance that uh, anybody uh, would, would recognize me as not being Franz Rath. My main worry was not meeting an inmate of the, that former concentration camp. All right. Huh? All right, so we're now back. Uh, you have become a close friend of Gert Hengerer, who was uh, tell us about Heinrich Müller, who he was. Yeah. And well, Heinrich Müller was the head of the Gestapo. He was a um, 
lieutenant general in the SS. He had been a policeman in Munich. He was a favorite of Himmler, the leader of the um, SS. And he had risen very rapidly um, in the ranks of the SS. He was Eichmann's boss. You've heard about Eichmann, who was executed by the Israelis. Well, Müller was Eichmann's boss. I mean, Eichmann took orders direct from Müller. Müller was very much wanted after the war. Müller was a man who left very little trace, whereas the intelligence services of Britain and America found lots of information about various high-ranking Nazis, SS generals. Very little was found about Müller. And Müller had just disappeared from the face of the earth. He went by the name Gestapo Müller. Yes, he was known as Gestapo Müller uh, amongst the German people. Right. You know, he was very much feared. Um, his subordinates all hated him. Um, even people hired and he were afraid of him. And Hanger had been his adjutant. But Müller had worked for more than nine months on a plan when he realized that Germany was going to lose the war anyway, um, he wanted to bring the SS underground and keep it there till it could come up again at, for them better times. And he had prepared his plans very carefully. This, of course, I all learned from Hanger. I mean, Hanger, Hanger's name and record had been removed from the SS personnel files. I mean, we never found any reference to a Colonel Hangera in the SS files uh, because Müller had removed him, removed it. Because Hangera was the man who was used by Müller to return to Germany and set up this outer circle. After the war. After the war. Well, where was Müller? Where is Müller today? But where was he in 1958? Um, Müller was alive in 1958 and he was in Zurich. With, where did he get money? Müller escaped from Germany with 75,000 pounds in, in weight of gold. Gold, raw, pure gold. Raw, pure gold, which had come from the concentration camps. I mean, Müller's department controlled the concentration camps. So everything that was taken from the concentration camps inmates, such as jewelry, uh, precious stones, even the gold fillings from their teeth, uh, had been sent to Müller, to Müller's department. And Hengerer told me that, that 75,000 pounds of gold, um, plus numerous precious stones, and something like 10 million Swiss francs in cash, uh, had been at Müller's disposal after the war. Now, you have told me that Hengerer has told you that right at the end, the last few days in April of 1945, Müller went to the bunker in Berlin, confronted Hitler, with yes. Bormann at his side, right. asked for him to appoint him the successor to keep the yes. party and tell us that story. The way I hear it from Hanger that on the 28th of April, which I think is two days before the end, um, Miller was called to the bunker to uh, deal with a man called Fagelein, who was Himmler's representative at Hitler's headquarters. Himmler had been found out to be negotiating a peace or trying to negotiate peace with the Western Allies through Count Bernadotte of Sweden. When Hitler learned this, he became furious and he thought that Fagelein was an accomplice of, of Himmler. And he called Miller to come to the bunker and question, interrogate Fagelein. This was done on, the, on April the 28th and this is the last day that that uh, Müller has been seen alive by anybody, except Hangler, of course. At that occasion, um, uh, Müller went to, the, went to Hitler and said, um, whatever, you know, our country is surrounded by our enemies, um, whatever's going to happen, do not let the SS die. Let me take it underground and uh, bring it back again when better times have arrived. And Hitler is supposedly liked that idea and appointed. Uh, Miller hadn't asked for it, but he, but he was appointed by Hitler as Himmler's successor as Reichsführer SS, the leader of the SS. Um, but Hengler said, no matter what Hitler had decided to do, I mean, uh, Miller had made his plans, 
to go underground and, and do it anyway, but he now did it with Hitler's blessing. Of course, Bormann had been there, had been present all during these conversations with Hitler, and um, Müller wanted no part of Bormann because Hitler had instructed him to work together with Bormann. Um, when um, Müller left the bunker, uh, he left behind uh, Hengerer with inst strict instruction not to let uh, Bormann escape. And when on the 29th, the morning of the 29th of April, um, Bormann came out, he was shot by Hengerer, shot and killed, and his body was dumped in an underground cellar close to, the, to Hitler's bunker, where in fact it was discovered many, many years later. And the dentist certified that this was these were the remains of, uh, of Bormann. Bormann has been hunted all over the world, as you probably know. Yes. But um, he was dead. All right, now this is what Hengra has told you years later. Yes. Um, let's move back now to 5960, I presume we are now. You've become a confidant of Hengra's. Yes. Tell us about the Nazi meetings. The well, the first one I attended was shortly after I had my own factory. Making? Making metal windows and doors like my friend Daling okay. in München Gladbach. There were about 200 people present, mostly. No, I think all were men. All had their own businesses. Some were even lawyers and doctors. Other had industrial uh, factories. For four days of that week, um, we were indoctrinated with the importance of the recovery, the economic recovery of Germany. We were told that Germany had lost. Well, tell us about the first meeting and then the subsequent meetings with this outer ring, outer circle. Where was it when? The, the first meeting I attended was in 1960 and was held in a, almost called a castle, on the Rhine near Cologne. There were about 200 people present, all members of the outer ring. Former SS officers? Yes, there were army officers, naval officers. Not uh, just SS? No, not just SS. Okay. There were army and uh, air force and naval officers there. But they all had been given their own businesses, uh, not only industrial businesses, but some were lawyers and doctors, accountants. We were told that Germany had lost the war uh, economically alone, not militarily. The economic might of the United States, which of course was in the hands of the Jews, um, had forced Germany uh, on its knees. This must never happen again. Germany's economy had to be rebuilt so that Germany w was going to be the strongest nation in the world, not only militarily, but also economically, so that Germany could fight any war without losing it. That's why we had to work, and we had to work damned hard to achieve this. Um, they stressed hard work uh, continuously at this meeting, and I think the world has witnessed how hard Germany has worked. But. Um, it, it didn't just happen. It was really stimulated. Uh, one of the, uh, the men who uh, talked to us was SS General Sepp Dietrich. Now, he was an old Nazi from way back. He had the highest rank in the SS, uh, apart from Himmler. He had been convicted to life imprisonment by the Americans, but I think he was released after about six years only. He was then tried for murder because he had murned, murdered Ernst Ström, the S SR leader, mm -hmm. uh, and the Germans only gave him four years. But those four years were never spent in prison. Uh, he spent them at home. All the other meetings I have attended were all in that same trend. Now, I think you've told me that the first four days were business and the fifth was purely political. Yes, the fifth day was always purely political, um, and the, the first four days were business management. So, uh, in the early 60s then, what did you discover was going on in West Germany? Just that there was an outer ring, 
and that somewhere there was an inner ring. This I learned from Hengera. And the inner ring had the high-ranking former Nazis, mostly SS generals, party leaders, and present-day German government officials, uh, whether they were members of the German parliament, even ministers in the German cabinet. They were kept, those, th those names were kept secret. The inner ring was completely secret, and um, um, nobody who wasn't a member could go to a meeting. Although, in later years, the late 60s, Hanger took me along as a guard. Those meetings were heavily guarded. Um, they were mostly held in Frankfurt. Where in Frankfurt? Frankfurt Langen, which is a small place, you know, near Frankfurt. Or in a hotel or? A no, no, no private, private. Buildings. Residence? Or private residence, yes, very large. Um, there I have seen, um, for example, the German minister Schiller arrive. I've seen various members of parliament, of the German parliament. I've seen the uh, president of the Reichsbank, or the Bundesbank, arrive and attend the meetings. But I was there as a guard. I, I couldn't get inside. Now you've told me you have put together and deduced that the present Chancellor, Chancellor of West Germany, Helmut Schmidt, yes. is involved. Is Tell it? us in what way you think that's... Well, you must realize that the old Nazis are dying. I mean, dying a natural death. And they are impatient to see the rebirth of Nazism. There is a younger group who are not all that keen to um, to openly declare Germany, you know, Nazi. And there is a, um, a conflict of interest there. But eventually, I think the old diehards um, won because at one meeting of the inner circle, um, it was declared that the Fourth Reich had been proclaimed. And that the Fourth Reich had a new Führer. The name wasn't mentioned, but I saw um, Schmidt there. What year was that? The late or early 70s, late 60s or early 70s. I, can, I can't be exact anymore. But, uh, now he was not the Chancellor then? He was not the Chancellor then, no. This was before Brandt stepped down. and um, We were all told that Brandt was forced to step down uh, because he went to Warsaw and he knelt down at some monument for the Jewish ghetto there. And of course, this was completely unacceptable to the, to the Germans. I mean, every German that I have spoken to in those, those years condemned that, whether, you know, open Nazi or not. They all condemned him for it. Now, you've also told me that uh, in your reports, you discovered that, that Hengerer with Mueller's money were infiltrating Britain, Britain, which was what yeah. you was concerned was, what That's was right. happening with Britain. Um, Hanger had told me that um, Miller had used money, um, used his money, to bribe top union officials in England. and To do what? To create continuous labor unrest there. For and what reason? Well, they, to bring Britain down and to bring France down. They did the same in France, but they had more success in England. And you knew those names? You sent yes. those names to England? I knew the names, and one name was a British member of parliament. What's his name? Well, I'd be better not mention his name. Well, now why? Why won't you tell us his name? Just, you know. Well, maybe it's still the influence of the service. Okay, but you did, you did send these names back. Sent the name back, and I personally spoke to Harold Wilson about them. While he was prime minister? While he was prime minister. Now, we're getting ahead of our story. So you had gained Hengra's confidence. Yes. And you were, you've told me that you were being ready to be a, being admitted to the inner circle. And yes. what happened? Well, to become a member of the inner circle, apparently, involved more background checking. Especially in my case. You know, I was, maybe I was a dubious case. I discovered one day that Hengra's tone to me had changed. And, of course, 
when you are an undercover agent, you're very sensitive to that sort of thing because you know your life depends on it. Right. Um, I went to Hanger's office after I discovered this, knowing that he wasn't there. I had been very friendly with his secretary, and she told me. I said, "Why? What's wrong? Why is that Hanger angry with me?" And she said, uh, "Because he has discovered some irregularity in your in your background, you know. But I'm sure it can be explained." Well, I said, what has he discovered? She said, the blood group of uh, Franz Rand is different to yours. Uh, he has looked it up in medical records. There were no pictures of Franz Rath, no fingerprints in no. the original SS records? No, 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 they didn't go that far. They never, they never took that. And there were no dental records either. We had made sure of that. Okay. Well, there's only one thing I could do. Uh, get the hell out of Germany. Now, meantime, you had married Yes, my wife, my British wife, had divorced me. Uh, she had been retired or waiting. Couldn't blame her. And um, I had remarried a German girl. Of course, she only knew me as Franz Rand. So I had deceived her for years. And um, I went home, confronted her, and told her who I really was, and that I had to get out of Germany. I didn't expect her to. Uh, stay with me, but she did. It's a wonderful girl. She asked me whether I had married her because I loved her or whether I had married her because I needed her for my work. I told her I married her because I loved her, because I didn't need her for my work. She said that all that mattered, and she came with me. And together, with our German shepherds, we left Germany. Hmm. And well, tell us about the flight, what you went? Well, I, I got into my, my car, Mercedes, and drove straight to the airport in Amsterdam and boarded the plane there. Well, I went to the British consulate first and they contacted, uh, because I only had German papers, and they con contacted London for me and issued me with a temporary passport. And with that, most of us flew to London. When was this? This was in 1972. What date, do you remember? Yes, it was in March. March 72. March 72. Yeah. So then what happened? You'd now spent, uh, what, 16, 15 years? Yeah. 14 years. In Germany. Yeah. Well, we went back to, to England and debriefing started, which is a very tedious procedure where you're questioned on everything that has happened during the past years. Uh, of course, it's they're compared to your reports, the reports that I sent in regularly. Questioning was done by a Queen's Council, a fellow called Milmo. He's quite famous. He's, he works for the British counterintelligence. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a hard time, believe me. Um, okay. Well, now let's, let's kind of regroup here. What, what you're saying is... Richard, let's be sure. Let's, let's kind of regroup now. At, at this point, um, you had established yourself in West German society as an owner of a yeah. factory, yeah. Dusseldorf, manufacturing windows. You had been accepted by this man, Hengerer, who was the, even then, the representative, I guess you would say, of Gestapo Müller, right. who was then living in Switzerland in Zurich. and handing out the money yes. to do all these various things you're claiming. Right. You were reporting back to British Secret Service monthly. Yes. Reports. Week, weekly. Weekly. Well, well, weekly phone contacts, monthly reports. Right. And you were discovering what? That there was a widespread undercover Nazi organization in Germany. To do what? To ensure that the, German, that the Nazis would get, get back to power. Now, in spite of all the democratic reforms that came after the war and, and everything? What democratic reforms? I mean, the, the Germans never had democratic laws. To, to, to be governed by. They didn't like them. I mean, look what happened when the student uprising came in 1967. Um, every German uh, who had lived under Hitler was saying uh, Hitler wouldn't allow this sort of thing to happen. Hitler knew how to deal with these elements. You know, the Germans hated these uprisings. Well, now let's, let's retrace here. You called me the morning after Andreas Bader had supposedly committed suicide in his jail cell in West Germany, right. along with two or three of his comrades. His comrades. You call me and you said, as I recall the conversation, I can't remain silent any longer. 
Well, what did you know about Andreas Bader? Well, as I told you, um, every German who lived under Hitler condemned these student organizations, saying that Hitler would not permit this sort of thing. When Hitler was there, there was law and order in Germany. And now the government was seemed incapable of keeping law and order. The Nazis loved this. This was, you know, right up their street, as we say in England. And when the student uprisings died down, they decided to start a terrorist organization which could keep up the pressure. And I was present when Hengere recruited a friend of his two sons who were studying at Frankfurt University by the name of Andreas Bader. Now, what do you mean you were there? Tell us the, cir the circumstance. Well, Hengere discussed this with me and said we mustn't allow these uprisings to die down because it makes the people angry with, you know, with the democratic government. They, they're going to long back to a uh, Nazi government. More authoritarian. That's right. Yeah. Um, he actually asked me at first, you know, if I would be capable of starting a terrorist organization in Germany with the help of the PLO in Jordan. And of course that wasn't my task, so I turned that down. Told him I was too old for that sort of thing. And maybe weeks later he introduced me to a fellow I'd seen before who was a friend of his sons. Same age as his sons were. He had two sons hanging around. And this, this fellow was Andreas Bader. He was an ardent Nazi. Um, even when I'd met him before, he'd always been a Nazi. And Bader was given the job of organizing the, what they called the Red Army Faction. And they called it Red Army, of course, to blame the communists again. I mean, this is the old Nazi game, right? Blame, you know, do things and blame the communists. They did it with the, when the Reichstag was put on fire. Well, did it work? Oh, did yes. It? Oh, yes, it worked beautifully. What happened? Well, Bader recruited um, Meinhof, which was a woman, and I forgot most of the names, but uh, they're all history. And um, they were all sent to Jordan, where they were trained by the PLO. They went there with, with, with money from Müller. Well, now, what did the PLO have in all this? What did they care what was going on in West Germany? Well, I suppose the PLO were interested in uh, spreading terrorism. Why? Why? Isn't that part of their their credo, their belief? Okay. Um, and um, the Nazis have always had very close ties to the uh, to the PLO because of they both hate hate Jews. Now let me stop. There. Are you telling me that anti-Semitism is still? very much a part of West German thinking today? Oh yes, very much, very much. That the, that the horrors of the Holocaust are not... They don't believe the horrors of the Holocaust, right? I mean, um, I know German parents who have told their children that all this wasn't true. It's all, you know, Western Allied propaganda or Russian propaganda. And the children believe it? Oh yes, yes, definitely. I mean, if you look at school books, I've seen many German school books. I've never seen, I've looked on purpose, but I've never been able to find any reference to the Holocaust in, in German school textbooks. So we're almost back where we started right? too right. many years ago. That's right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Anyway, I know for a fact that Bader and his gang went to Jordan and came back trained. I also know from Hangarim that they were given the chance to empty a German armory. I think it was the one in um, Karlsruhe. Um, the guards were removed and transport was provided and it was later put that, you know, the terrorists had raided this armory. Now, for such a grand conspiracy to be going on, the, the generally most of the police of West Germany would have to be a part of it. Are you saying they are? Oh, yes, they are. Most of the government, the justice officials, would have to be a part of it. Are they you are. saying they yes. are? There are judges today in Germany who are who were judges in in Nazi days, right? There were uh, nearly every policeman in Germany today, except the younger ones, have all been ex-Nazis or Chief or of Nazis. Police of Munich, I think. You right, told me. the the Munich policeman. You know, I mean, there was a in in, in the Hague in Holland during the war it was Joseph Schreider, you know, and he was responsible for the killing of 60 Allied agents. And this man went free, and um, to my knowledge, he's still today Kriminalrat in Munich, head of the German police, of the Munich police. Well, 
Now, for all these years, you informed your British superiors of what was going on. Right. Uh, as you've told us, you had to leave, and you went back to England. What did you find waiting for you in England? Um, skepticism, disbelief, and in the end, from um, Harold Wilson, complete rejection. You met with Harold Wilson? Yes, I did. What did you tell him? He questioned me. He had read my report. He questioned me about it. And Your report saying that West Germans had bribed British Union officials right. and yes. some members of Parliament right. to disrupt the British economy. Right. You had the names. I had the names. Did you have anything beyond the names? I had the uh, Swiss bank account. I had the numbers. Now, how did you I, get that? I got it out of Hangar's attache case while he was with a girl. Okay. So you had what you would have regarded was proof. Proof, yes. What did Harold Wilson say to you? Harold Wilson said that he couldn't accept that his uh, friends, as he called them, in the West German government were Nazis, that he certainly couldn't accept that um, British Union leaders were part of this conspiracy. So what happened? The whole thing was put in a drawer and was supposed to be kept there. And I was told to keep my mouth shut, not to disclose anything, because I came under the Official Secrets Act and I could, go to, I could go to jail for 12 years. So then you were sent to this country yes. to live in retirement with right. your pension from the British Secret Service, how yes. much? $1,200 a month. And that's where you've lived since. Right. You've taken a turn, you've been arrested, you're charged now with forging U.S. passports. Right. They claim you have a record from around the world of being an international con man. Right. Why all that? To First discredit. of all, it's not true? No, it's not true. They just want to discredit me. And I'm surprised that uh, the FBI will go to such lengths to lie under oath unless they have been hoaxed themselves by the British Secret Service. How can we prove what your story is saying is true? How can it be proved? Well, the British, of course, have always denied, uh, even denied the existence of their Secret Service. They've never admitted to having one. They've never admitted to anybody being a member. Um, until such time as Philby betrayed them, nothing was known about the British Secret Service. Philby was the first man who came out in the open and published a lot of information about it. Which, of course, I must say, gives the, 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 a con man the perfect cover sure. yeah. for which he can never be unverified. That's right. Which yeah. is your position today. Yes. I've been discredited. And, you know, by that means, I hope to keep my story undercover. What do you think the most important part of your story is now? It's almost three years out of date now. It is. But I don't know whether you've heard, heard this, but the Nazis are now almost in the opening in Germany, right? They, they're holding um, SS reunion meetings quite out in the open. They sing their Nazi songs again. Um, but Richard, the Nazis, what happened in Germany in the late 30s, now 40 years ago, was a quite different time. Right. Germany was an economic chaos. They are just the opposite today. Yes. It seems, it doesn't seem logical that the same kinds of things would happen all over again. No, it will not happen exactly the same way as it did in the 30s. But the Nazis are still out after the same thing they were, they were after in 1930. That is, they want to conquer the world. This is in the German soul and you'll never get it out of it. Would you ever go back to West Germany? No, not very likely. What if they took you back? What if someone would make you go back? What? I would be disposed of. Killed? Yes. You think that's a possibility? That's a possibility, yes. Even though you were, let's say, legally extradited for something that you, that would only be a cover? It'd be a cover. I don't suppose they go home. Okay. Well, now, you have told me that in, in this past week, and this again is December 9th, 1977, in this past week, two British agents have talked to you. Yes. In other words, you, you claim that you have been arrested and charged with this simply to discredit you with me, with CBS, right, uh, and to dispose of this. That's right. Now, let's type a few loose ends. You know that we had a call placed to Germany, yes. to the factory of Franz Roth, yes. Oh, 10 days, two weeks ago, and, and, and a voice said, yes, he's here, we'll put him, bring him to the phone. Right. Well, now you claim you were Franz Roth. What, what's, 
happening? Well, of course, <coughs> I don't know what has happened. I can only think back and, and if I put myself in the position of Hanger, who had to cover up, he must have realized I was a foreign or British agent. Um, they could have claimed Franz Rad died, right? Or put a new man in there. And I think they've done the cleverest thing. They've put a new man there. So they can now say, well, there's Franz Rad. I mean. But you know, Richard, that's incredible to me because you lived there for 15, 16 years. Yeah. Suddenly, there's got to be people that you dealt with in your life. So that's not Franz Rad. Are you kidding? That's not Franz Rad. How could that be done? Well, I, I don't, don't know, Joe, how it can be done, but obviously it has been done. Um, come to think of it, the people I have dealt with have been mostly people within the organization, right? And of course my workers in the factory. My key workers were all members of the organization, they were provided uh, for me by the organization. Um, the Germans are a very disciplined people. If authority goes there and says, look, from now on this man is Franz Rad, and no questions asked, they will accept that. Well, what's your future then? What's going to happen to you? Well, if the British get their way, they'll um, deport me to England, where they can charge me under the Official Secrets Act for having talked to you, and they know I've talked to you, and I can go to jail for 12 years. Well, then why are you really almost sitting in concrete by letting yourself be filmed today? Because I'm afraid that if I don't go willingly, they will kidnap me or force me in some other way. Um, to go back, and I don't want to go back. What uh, if you What if you found out you had to go to West Germany, for example? Well, I would face a certain death, because the organization there um, are ruthless. You think the British would let that happen? I don't think so. No, I still I hope I still hope not. But uh, I, you know. But I, you do. But you do. At sitting here now, facing me, think you're going to prison in England for what you've already told. Yes. Do you think it was worth it? Well, I have spent 16 years of my life trying to uncover these facts, right? And these 16 years would have been completely wasted. I have lost a wife. I haven't seen my children grow up. And those are the things that hurt. And that's why I wanted this thing uncovered. I wanted the truth to be told. What do you say to a lot of people who are looking at you now saying that's the most incredible, unbelievable story I've ever heard? Who does that guy think? He's talking to a bunch of idiots. Well, Joe, truth is stranger than fiction, right? I mean, stranger stories have happened during the war, and we are dealing with the same people. What do you think is going to happen? Are the Germans, are the Nazis going to do what they, you say they're trying to do? Oh, yes, they're going to do that. Really? Yes. Why are you, why are you so sure? Because I've lived with them. I, I know their intent. I know their how fanatic they are at it, right? They're going to come on top again. They may not be in the form as in, in the 30s, uh, exactly like Hitler. It will be in some other form. But Germany is going back to be a dictatorship. Are there no people left in Germany? Are there no people in Germany today who are in a position to stop this, to talk about it, to, to hear your story and say, we must uncover what's going on? Well, I think uh, Willy Brandt is a man like that. I think the way he was put aside by the Nazis shows that they had no time for him. I think he was an honest German, but I think on the whole, German people are like that. They like a dictatorial government. I've seen young students, uh, very radical, change after they reach the age of maturity and uh, become just like the older Germans. I forgot to ask you, do you think Andreas Bader and his colleagues committed suicide in themselves? Oh, no way. I mean, Bader and his, his uh, friends were not the type to commit suicide. I mean, what I think happened was they were kept in prison too long. In previous years, they've always been allowed to escape. They were captured, escaped, captured, escaped continuously. Bader was never in prison very long. I think this time they kept him too long. And he... I know from the newspapers that he asked to see somebody close to um, the Chancellor, to Schmidt, a man with a Russian or Polish sounding name, um, who indeed went to see him. Now, do you really think that 
a high German government official would go and see a terrorist because they just asked to see him. I think this man went to see what Bader wanted because they were worried what Bader was going to do. And I think Bader threatened exposure if they didn't let him out. And the situation was such that uh, Schmidt just couldn't let him out. And that's why they were killed. They were murdered. Yeah. Do you have any contact left with anyone in Germany? No. No contact. So you don't really know that? No. But You're just surmising? That's just my, my surmise. You think your future is secure or are you worried? I'm very worried. Very worried. Spy novels are true. Yes. Well, Richard Sanders, we will uh, watch with great interest to see what the future holds for you. Thank you. Now let me restate because I want to get some specifics here. Heinrich Mueller, the man known as Gestapo Mueller, the head of the Gestapo during World War II, according to what your friend Hingwer told you, survived, yes. took a great amount of gold to Switzerland, put it in Swiss, in Swiss, Swiss, Swiss bank, numbered accounts, and financed the rebirth of the Fourth Reich, the Gestapo movement, the SS, whatever, with Hengra ba ba being basically his bag man in West Germany and the world. Right. Um, I, I think it's fair to say no trace has been found of Mueller after the war. No. And yet you have had some contact with him those years. Tell us about that. Well, I've had no direct contact with the man. Um, Hanger and uh, Hanger's assistant, a man called Grüning, um, were the only contacts that I know of. But I've been present in rooms when the phone would ring, and if you picked up the phone, you would hear a voice that would say, Müller. And I've seen the reaction of Hanger and Gruning to that. I mean, I've seen them jump. I've seen them go white. Um, so I know that the man who was on the other side was indeed Gestapo Miller. You, no, you, you just, could tell by the reactions of him. Just for purposes of identification, to answer my next question in German, so that we'll have a sample of you speaking German. What kind of a man is Hanger, and where does he live today? Tell us a little bit about Hanger, but tell us to it in German. Um, Hengere ist ein typischer SS-Offizier. Er lebt in Stuttgart. Er kommt von Baden-Württemberg, wo sehr viele fanatische Nazis äh, herkommen. Und Hengere ist ein fanatischer Nazi und wird auch das bleiben, bis er tot ist. What kind of a man to be with? In English or in German? In German. Das hängt davon ab, natürlich. Um, wenn man Nazi ist, dann ist er ein feiner Freund, ein Kamerad. Wenn man kein Nazi ist, dann macht er jemand krank. Nur um lange mit ihm zusammen zu sein. Ich habe praktisch ein, ein Spiel mit ihm gespielt. Ich habe immer vorgetan, als ob ich auch Nazi wäre. Und äh, ob, ich habe ihn bewundert, das hat er gerne, nicht? Und deshalb habe ich so viel von ihm erfahren. I don't understand all of what you've just said, but let me anticipate somebody perhaps seeing this film now, hearing your German say, that's impossible, that man could never have passed as a native-born German. What do you say to that? No, that's not true. I mean, my German is perfect. As a, um, somebody who comes from the Rhineland, of course, I mean, there are different dialects throughout Germany, and my dialect is a Rhineland dialect. I think it was interesting. You had you had to pretend that you didn't understand or could read English all those yes. years. That was the most difficult part. Very difficult, because I went to to Hong Kong with Hanger, and I went to New Delhi with him, where on English was spoken on vacation. Yes, but you had to pretend you didn't understand, or right. that was that was extremely hard. Yeah, yeah. But somehow I got through. Yeah. Do you speak German now at all with your wife at home? Never. No, on principle, we don't speak German together. Okay. For, purposes of, for purposes of verification of this interview, I'm having the cinematographer who has filmed it, Glenn Kirkpatrick, to come into camera so we can verify that today is what date? December 9th, 1977. Where are we? We're at WTBJ Public Affairs in Miami, Florida. Right. Uh, this entire interview has been recorded with the three of us present in this room, the screening room at Channel 4. 
and again December 9th, 1977.